Today's session is all about building an interagency wellness system through school wellness centers. And we have three incredible presenters here with us today that I'm very excited to introduce you to, and then I'm going to pass it off. So let me start by just giving you a little idea of who our presenters are. And on this next slide, you'll have a chance to see, uh, see put some faces, some names as I go. I'd like to start by introducing you to our first speaker, who's Dr. Cesar Morales. As County Superintendent of Schools since 2021, Dr. Morales leads the Ventura County Office of Education, which provides teacher training and administrative support services to Ventura County's 20 school districts. VCOE also operates schools for students with special needs and at-risk students and provides career education for students countywide. Prior to his current role, Dr. Morales served as a deputy, deputy superintendent and associate superintendent of student services for VCOE. Before that, he served for nearly six years as a superintendent of the Oxnard School District. He has held leadership roles in the Lawndale and Lenox School Districts in Los Angeles County, and also has experience in the classroom as a middle school and high school teacher. I'd also like to introduce you to Regina. Regina Reed is Director of Personnel Development for Ventura County uh, SELPA, which she served for the last eight years. Prior to joining, Regina was principal at Phoenix School of Ventura County Office of Education Public School. Regina worked in the Simi Valley Unified School District for 22 years, and during her time there, she was a special education teacher for students with moderate to severe disabilities, a program specialist supporting students who are placed in residential facilities, and a site principal. I also want to introduce you to David Swanson Hollinger, who is Ventura County Human Service Agency Deputy Director of the Department of Children and Family Services. David, I think about you answering the phone and how long that must take to say that. He has worked for more than 30 years in the health and human services field in direct practice, administration, and leadership. His diverse work history has included public child welfare, public mental health, nonprofit social and health services, serving children and families, and Medi-Cal managed care. Throughout his career, he has been committed to cross-system, integrated approaches to a full services continuum that support and empower those served and that promote a system of child and family wellness. And with that, I want to say welcome to our presenters. We're so excited for this conversation. Dr. Morales, take it away. Thank you. Um, we're glad to be here and glad and honored to have an opportunity to share our story. I think I speak for uh, David and Regina when I say uh, we're only three members of the Ventura County family of leaders. Uh, there's many of us that could have been interchanged for the three of us here uh, because we definitely are uh, committed to serving our com uh, community in as deep a way possible. We, we began our journey uh, with the goal of, of, of more deeply connecting with one another by understanding what each one of our departments and agencies did, uh, how we interface with the community so we can become uh, more efficient and leverage each other's strengths and be able to fill each other's gaps of service uh, whenever necessary and uh, all the way to leveraging each other's resources, staffs, and, and resources. It's been a beautiful journey. And uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out uh, to uh, Lori Clark from San Diego State uh, for her key role in being able to uh, facilitate uh, all the multiple leaders of all of our diverse agencies as uh, we've developed a vision that we will later share. Um, and uh, really come together um, in a coherent way and in a scheduled way of meeting with one another on an ongoing basis. Um, a little bit as we've built our wellness system uh, together, I wanna give you a little bit of uh, background on who we are. Um, so I'll ask you to, to move to the next slide. Um, as you can see here, this is a, a snapshot of who we are, we're about 850,000 uh, uh, number of residents, uh, but you can see there um, the interplay between California and what is a, a big key target zone of, um, of our county. Uh, as you can see, we have the data and the data shows us 
uh, that we need to not just look at the overall county information, but really look at where uh, the zone is with the highest amount of need. Uh, this Kamala McKenna uh, neighborhood uh, and adjacent neighborhoods um, in our county uh, represents uh, the highest amount of referrals or um, level of service for all the agencies involved in this effort. Uh, so um, it's very important to, uh, when we're uh, having discussions and making plans on implementation, that we always uh, lead with uh, knowing where the highest uh, need is and look at it as the highest opportunity that we can leverage each other's strengths uh, to better serve. Um, the data supports um, our vision. Um, as you can see, we presently perform at or better than the statewide averages. Um, and the target community that I just mentioned, such as depicted here, uh, the percentage of families living in poverty is double the state average and triple the countywide average. So that's important to know, but a, a, a bit of information not on this slide, as we represent the, the, the kindergarten through uh, 12th grade school system where we compile data. We also have data from the preschool early childhood space. Um, that number is more like one in every two uh, students in the K-12 uh, data system uh, qualifies for free and reduced lunch. So the, the need that we have in our school system as reflected by the information that is shared um, in the school-wide uh, data systems even uh, demonstrates a greater need and one that's growing in every sector of our county, even uh, sectors of the county where we once thought uh, were primarily middle class or upper middle class uh, zones where there wasn't a need. A variety of our departments in the County Office of Education, as well as agencies in the county, have seen an escalation in referrals for a variety of services as um, the housing insecurity persists all throughout California. Uh, the, the median household price of a, a home in, in uh, Ventura County is between $800,000 and $900,000. Uh, uh, with um, a median rental of an apartment uh, that's two bedrooms is between $2,400 and $2,600. So as you can see, the, the, the need is only going to become uh, a greater. Um, presently, this target neighborhood also has a higher percentage of single parent, uh, head of household, uh, larger family sizes, along with the lower income. Um, if we could go on to the next slide. With this in mind, uh, Ventura County, um, our entire group has developed a phased approach within our comprehension prevention plan. Um, so as you can see here, the, the five zip code characteristics that are uh, a hot zone that we're uh, looking at, um, the ethnicity, uh, primarily is uh, Latinx and immigrant families. Um, and we definitely feel that whenever we em implore a place-based uh, approach, um, as is this hot zone in the city of Oxnard, um, we're closer to the community and the community is closer to the services uh, that are needed. Uh, next slide. So I, I wanna go ahead and take this time um, to read the vision um, that we've come up with as a Ventura County family of agencies that are committed um, to this service work. Um, our vision going forward is to create a child, youth and family wellness system by aligning government, community and family stakeholders to maximize wellness and quality of life. So all children and their families are safe, healthy, educated, and well with a sense of belonging, purpose, and opportunity to achieve their aspirations. You know, I, I want that to, to kind of simmer in. And as we look at this vision that all of us were a part in, in collecting, I want you to know that 
the leadership reflected of all the agencies that are part of this group, uh, we all look at this and say, what is our role here? What is our role in implementing this vision? And what is our responsibility in communicating the work that we're doing with each other so that we can minimize duplicative work done by different agencies? And we um, have a culture of sharing uh, where we can learn uh, to be efficient across agencies. Um, and uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, David. Hey, thank you, Dr. Morales. And I'm going to spend a few, several minutes kind of talking a bit more about that, the foundational aspects of, of our wellness system and then transition into how that specifically rate, relates to well, uh, wellness centers and, and the variety of different activities we're doing in our county uh, that, that are tied to that work. As Dr. Morales talked about, he, he articulated the vision, which was, was really a group effort uh, that was developed in partnership with our system partners, as well as those with lived expertise. And it, there was a lot of work that came into us, as, as he alluded to, of, of us identifying, you know, how does this vision relate to the world that I work in or that he works in, or that I know there's a number of partners on our call on this, on this webinar from Ventura, how does it relate to their world? And so this isn't that it's about public child welfare, which is the system which I work in. It's about family wellness, child, youth, and family wellness. And if we're supporting that, we're going to have positive impacts across our various systems. And one of the things that we did collectively was it was to develop uh, a theory of change, which you see on here, that we want to increase access to service supports and wellness, increase alignment and strengthen uh, protective factors to, to really look at those social determinants of health. Ideally, that's going to allow families to be supported in their communities, ultimately without public system and formal system involvement, particularly those systems that have disproportionately brought uh, in, in our county and in many, many counties, families of color into their, like, like the public child welfare system and, and others. And it's, it's been a very intentional effort over the last couple of years to build that larger why and, and what's in it for all of us as we then think about how to how we're going to work together in a collective way across our various initiatives that we, that we work in. Uh, next slide, please. And we didn't actually use this term, but this this was how we as a county have operationalized the the work through Assembly Bill 2083 and the expectations through Assembly Bill 2083, which in itself, for those that are familiar with it, is written pretty narrowly, uh, really written about children with, with more complex needs in the out-of-home care or foster care system. We very intentionally took that broader wellness system approach as a county that we need to look at child and family serving systems in a much more comprehensive global way. And if we're doing that well, we will address those, those young people that tend to have more complex needs that we all are collectively touching. Within our, our system of care work, we've organized the work into four buckets, as you see here, and, and guiding frameworks of infrastructure, practice, family engagement, and capacity building. And, and for those that have gotten into the weeds of the MOU itself, you can see in the, in the white lettering there, there are elements and tenants of the MOU that that apply to each of those, but really trying to take a, an organized way to begin to, to do that work. And also to very intentionally look at those various initiatives that were that are touching multiple systems. Dr. Morales referred to the comprehensive prevention plan, uh, which has we have recently been had approved in our county. And that was something that that came to the ILT to our interagency leadership team for approval. Uh, school wellness centers, which we're going to talk much more about today, CalAIM and other cross-system initiatives all really fall under that larger umbrella of, of our system of care work and really trying to look at all of those from that larger system of care context. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of who, who we're talking about when we talk about these system partners, you see here, uh, there's two slides of this, uh, those partners and those with the asterisks are those that are formally on our executive leadership team or interagency leadership team. And, and there actually should be an asterisk on the bottom one there, Gold Coast Health Plan, which just since we've developed this PowerPoint has been added to our, our leadership team there right now at the Medical Managed Care Plan in our county and, and a critical partner in our work as we go forward. But we've also gone beyond, this goes beyond what the expectations are for the state for the MOU, but also 
knowing that even beyond what's written into that memorandum, there, there are a number of other partners that are critical, uh, public health, ambulatory care, actually ambulatory care and public health. These are all interagency leadership teams <laughs> members, actually. The require, I'm sorry, those asterisks are the required ones. These are all the ILT members. My, my apologies. But those, so those are the uh, those are the interagency leadership team. And then on the next slide, we have a number of other partners that make up our larger governance infrastructure. And you can see some of them there. This is not an inclusive list, but we have developed an infrastructure and a governance structure to both formally operationalize the aspects, those system level aspects of the memorandum, things like data sharing, um, things like like looking at, at screening and entry and, and some other things we'll, we'll talk about. And we know that we need to be engaging our both our community partners, our public partners, our system partners, and especially those with lived expertise who, who have played a critical role in our work. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in some later slides. Next slide, please. I do want to elevate one aspect in particular is the integrated core practice model, which I'm guessing many are familiar with. This is a practice, both a leadership and a practice framework that is intended to apply across the systems that touch children and families. So it's not meant to replace different systems. It, it really is meant to complement uh, the, the types of practice models that my system or the Office of Education or Behavioral Health or Public Health or others use to identify a common way of, of leading, a common way of, of creating experiences for families when they touch our work, you know, common approach to, to the vision and the concepts and the values, as you see here. So we've been very intentional in rolling out ICPM with our system, starting with the executive leadership and management level across our various programs, across our various departments and agencies in training those leaders initially to understand and build those values into our collective work together. And we're in the process now of rolling this out in a much more robust way across all of our system partners and over the next couple of years. And so that's been a key part of helping to identify that common why and that common language, even just the process of us all getting in a room together and, and having conversations and learning about the ICPM has helped to develop those relationships and the trust that's so critical in, in how we do that work. Uh, together uh, going forward. So next slide, please. So I know this is this webinar is really about wellness centers. So I want to transition to that and, and to provide a little bit of context for how we, we are organizing this. Our interagency leadership team a while back recognized that that wellness, the wellness center approaches happening in our county are, are critical to our integrated work together. And just realize that we need to be leveraging the work that's already been happening to identify where we can promote further integration, where we can strengthen our partnerships, where we can understand where the commonalities are among the different wellness center models that are happening in our county. That, that term wellness center is used in different ways to mean slightly different things within our county, which we'll get into in a bit. And realize that for us to really leverage this work, it's critical that we understand those those models and, and where those opportunities are with those models. And so coincidentally to this webinar in our last interagency leadership team meeting, which is actually was a combined meeting with our kind of our operational leadership group called our wellness system planning committee. We did a deep dive uh, with those, that combined group of these four models of wellness centers. And to begin that, that collective understanding across the different systems, because almost every partner was probably touching at least one or more of these in some capacity, but uh, probably, well, none of them, except for probably Dr. Morales and his team at BCOE were touching all of them. And it was really an opportunity for us to begin that, that conversation about how these all fit uh, within our collective uh, collective wellness system. So I'm not going to, we'll go through each of these briefly. We'll go into a much deeper dive of, of that one on the top left, the, the VCOE wellness centers, and then talk a bit about how the others relate both to the, the school wellness work, as well as our, our future system of care work over the next, next 45 minutes or so. And with that, I'm going to transfer it to Regina. Thank you, David. So we're excited to share the partnerships that have been formed here in Ventura County due to the implementation of the wellness centers. 
So we're just going to touch briefly on the governance funding and finance and share how the K-12 wellness centers came to fruition. So data is formally connect, collected on all services provided in the wellness centers, such as screenings, assessments, and referrals. We also collect formal and informal data on a quarterly basis to determine next steps of care for our students and families. And that includes extended hours in some of our wellness centers to provide consistent services to our families throughout the county. So more than 2 million children, adults, and seniors are affected by potentially disabling mental health challenges every year in California. So to ensure that all people get the support they need, our state voters in 2004 approved Proposition 63, which is known as the Mental Health Services Act, MHSA. And this law calls for transformation of the mental health system while improving the quality of life for Californians living with mental health challenges. Because of MHSA, the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission was created, the MHSOAC. The MHSOAC administers the Mental Health Student Services Act, which is a competitive grant program established to fund partnerships between county behavioral health departments, in our case, Ventura County Behavioral Health, and local education entities, which would be VCOE. VCOE then allocated funding to districts to start up and implement wellness centers. The purpose of this funding was to increase access to mental health services in locations that are easily accessible to students and their families. And funds are to be used to impact the following on our school campuses, suicide prevention services, dropout prevention services, placement assistance and service plans, and outreach to high risk youth. So what are our goals for our wellness centers in our K-12 settings? We wanna make sure that mental illness is not um, becoming so severe and disabling for our students and families. We wanna reduce those risk factors that negatively affect mental health and the academic success of our students. We wanna improve access to school and community-based mental health services for both students and families. And we also use the uh, wellness centers to provide a safe and supportive environment where high school students can discuss their concerns and needs in a safe, non-judgmental space. And then we're very proud that our wellness centers are for peers by peers. Some of the services provided in the wellness centers are mental health screenings, assessments, and referrals. Uh, we provide prevention and early intervention services, short-term mental health services, suicide prevention, dropout prevention, and as I mentioned, a safe space for students to come. <clears throat> so how it all started and where we are now in Ventura County. So SB HIP utilizes the same wellness center models as others throughout the county. This way, we're ensuring that no matter where a student or family moves within our county, they'll know the services are available to them through the wellness centers. So let's look at some of the impacts that our wellness centers have had on middle school impacts and outcomes. So for middle school in the 22-23 school year, we had a little over 54,000 visits to the wellness center, but keep in mind these are duplicated numbers as students visit the center more than once in the school year. There were about 200 plus trainings or presentations on mental health topics for staff and students. Again, touching on social emotional learning, suicide awareness, the basics of mental health and well being, mindfulness, tools for anxiety and stress, and other topics. So, for our high schools in the 22 23 school year, a little over 25,000 visits were made to the wellness centers. You see this number, 476,000 students were reached through 950 plus awareness and education events. Again, that's a duplicated number because um, several students were serviced more than once through awareness and education events. This year, we're already seeing the impacts that the middle school wellness centers are having on our incoming ninth graders. 
the majority of ninth grade students on the 11 high school campuses have heard of or have already stepped into a wellness center since they had one in middle school. Many ninth grade students are coming in for services or they're referring their friends for services and resources. So the stigma around mental health in high school is being greatly reduced due to the implementation of middle school wellness centers. And, and Regina, just, just to, to add a little bit, um, the numbers that aren't captured here are also some positive unintended consequences of our wellness centers. Our students are referring uh, their parents or families as well to county services that they're now becoming familiar with just overall by attending the wellness center or through the peer leaders that talk about, uh, say as an example, coping with stress in the home, they're starting to uh, learn about what is the root cause of that stress. And um, if uh, there's counseling services available for their families. Uh, one story, just anecdotally, um, a high school student um, um, started discussing with uh, her counselor that she felt that the root cause was uh, dealing with finances in the home. And she sought out counseling services for her parents, which also led to uh, finding a class in the community on financial literacy and small business opportunities. Now, all of the, those are organic in nature, but it goes to show you the power of empowering our students and giving them information as they meet the needs of themselves putting the oxygen mask on themselves first, and then also feeling empowered and helping their entire home. It is just amazing to see some of that organic, um, just power in, in action. Thank you, Cesar. So some of the high school student impacts and outcomes. So a campus-wide access and awareness survey was administered to all the high school wellness centers. Um, Buena High School did not have post data, um, you'll notice on the uh, chart, because they were for a little while without a coordinator. This year, we've already administered the survey, and we will um, be looking forward to looking at those results in May and sharing them. But you can see on the graphics the impact that these services are having for our students. Parents and communities, as Cesar mentioned, are also being impacted. We've provided over 100 trainings or presentations on mental health topics for families in the middle school cent wellness centers, and then over 130 trainings presentations um, in the high school wellness centers. Some of those topics have included grief and loss, healthy relationships, mental health in your team, mental health 101, suicide awareness, human trafficking, substance abuse, and many others. So I know there's a question about what does peer-to-peer -peer support look like? Here is an example. So currently all of the high school, all eight high schools and all 11 middle schools have 10 wellness peers per center. This year we had 110 high school and 80 middle school wellness peers trained in suicide awareness, coping skills, mindfulness, mental health 101, self-esteem and awareness, leadership, resiliency, recognizing the early signs of mental health issues, cultural awareness, and many other topics. So peer-led, what are some of the things that the peers are doing? They're promoting the center on their school site through events and communication. They're planning the activities to let their peers know the wellness center is there and what they can provide. They provide support to the wellness center participants. They're connecting students with appropriate community resources. They're providing mental health education to students through the wellness centers and the guidance of the counselors. Helping to dis, uh, distribute information about any on-site resources that students might need. Developing and participating in wellness center workshops. I know most of them have something that goes on every month. Um, and might be related to a theme. And the peers are helping to develop and promote those. And then as we mentioned earlier, like with the middle schoolers who, uh, who are now in ninth grade and already know about the wellness centers, 
being able to refer their friends to the wellness center for additional support. So this is a picture of one of the wellness centers at Ventura High School. Um, many of our centers have added a basic needs pantry in their center to essentially provide a true wraparound service to their students. And the pantries have been created because students have been requesting some of these items. It might be simple um, school items, pens and pencils. It might be some simple hygiene items, things like that. Um, but these are all provided within the wellness center. So I just wanna share that the impact that the Ventura County Office of Education Wellness Centers have had in K-12 settings is possible because of all of the relationships that uh, David and Cesar talked about within our, our Ventura County ecosystem. The success and impact these centers have created can only give us hope for our future generations. Breaking stigmas around mental health or even stigmas around accessing mental health services is due to the partnerships created here in Ventura County. We look forward to the continued partnerships to promote the no wrong door approach for our students and their families. And then you can see on this um, last slide with me, several of the quotes that are both from students and families and how the wellness centers have already been impacting their lives. Okay. Before we go on to, to David, I just wanna, take a time out and just pause. There's been a lot of information there, uh, but something I, I really want the, the audience to, to know um, is the deep commitment of all the agencies um, in order to keep the wellness centers alive. Uh, while Ventura County Office of Education is representing the wellness center movement here in this presentation, I don't wanna minimize the fact that each individual school district that has wellness centers within their high schools and middle schools. And we're starting to see even some in elementary schools uh, developed are, uh, are making a deep commitment with also financial resources. Um, the Board of Supervisors um, is also making a deep commitment to continue to support wellness centers uh, through their uh, work through Ventura County Behavior Health um, in uh, different grants or the MHSA program, you know, but in order for the wellness centers to continue to be sustained, uh, the school districts do have to make a big stake in commitment, and it is going to be tested in the next one to two years as one-time money is dried up, and it's going to dry up for the school system as well as the county system, but our community is built right now because of our partnerships that we're talking about right now to ensure that the wellness centers stay alive. You know, presently school districts are, are funding the, the staff in the wellness centers uh, probably uh, 80 to 90% with uh, uh, 10% uh, to, to 20 coming from the assistance from MHSA. However, um, what we're finding is it's not just the financial resources that are necessary. What's become more important is being able to leverage the resources and staff of routine functions and all of the agencies and just learning how to work in a more coherent way is becoming more impactful. And the numbers associated to service um, through the wellness center are astronomical and outperforming the traditional methods. So that's why I think we're, we're all compelled to work collectively to make sure that the wellness centers aren't at risk of, of going away, but rather figuring out how to amplify their impact. And I'm liking what I'm seeing in all of our school districts that adopted wellness centers in all of their high schools they on their own wanted to do it at the middle schools. And those that have done all uh, middle school wellness centers are already halfway through uh, the elementary world. So um, I'm expecting this uh, to be a continued uh, collaborative effort uh, because I think everyone with the support of all the governing board members in every school district 
uh, the Office of Education in, uh, in my agency, as well as the Board of Supervisors and the collective leadership from the CEO and all the directors of the agencies under the County of Ventura's umbrella of services are all deeply committed to making uh, this uh, be able to continue to happen. David? Yeah, thank you. That's a Really appreciate that that high level summary and and I have to say also as a and at a personal level I'm also a parent of of two sons one of one one I got out of the house but the other one is is a high is a high school student high school senior and he's one of those many across the county that is fortunate to have a wellness center in his high school and and he's talked about it and and talked about how his you know his friends have used it and how it's been beneficial and and he understands the work I do in my work and and it's led to some really good conversations that we've been able to have about about addressing stigmas uh that we know are still out there around accessing support and and particularly accessing services for for mental wellness and so it's been you know great to to see it in action in a personal way in my own house so thank you to you know Dr. Marlos and Regina for the leadership in this and it absolutely is a is a cross-system effort what I'm going to now transition to is to give a couple of examples of how we are starting to look at taking that foundation that that Dr. Morales and Regina just talked about and applying it uh, to to other wellness center models as well as to other initiatives within within the school space. And so, I'm going to get into a little bit three other uh, wellness models that were talked about with our interagency leadership team. The first here is a long title, Winemi Elementary School District Wellness Center Community Pathway Pilot. But essentially what this is, is we have a specific district in one of our communities that, that and this goes back to that, that early slide that Dr. Morales showed us with some of that data and some of those impact communities. This, the Winemi district and the schools that we're talking about within this district are in those some of in some of those impacted communities that where families have have additional stressors where they often have you know, disproportionate involvement in in my system and other systems and so it's an area where we want to provide some additional supports and and look at opportunities to to strengthen the work that we're doing in those communities with this wellness center is is essentially a similar model but it's specifically funded through uh, some Cal AIM funding through the, oh gosh, SB HIP, School Bay, help me out here. <laughs> it, it's, I don't have the acronym in front of me, but it's, it's, it's a model of, uh, it's, it's a funding stream that actually routes through our Medi-Cal managed care plan to fund wellness center works tied to, to some of the, the larger state level integration and state level behavioral health reform that's happening. Um, and I'm sure someone's putting it in the chat as we're talking here. This is a center that's just getting up and running. And so it's one that we're working on, on developing. I'll get into some of the specifics in the next couple of slides in partnership with the Office of Education, with Gold Coast, our medical managed care plan, uh, with public health, and, and of course, our child welfare partners um, initially. And wanting to use this as an opportunity to, to pilot some of our, in, our integration strategies across our wellness system work. So some of our programmatic strategies, some of our financial strategies, information sharing, training, governance, community engagement, a number of different elements. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about, about those as, as we go forward. Okay, so you're on that next slide. The next slide here gets into one big aspect of it, something that has been in operation for a while, which is kind of a complement to the wellness center approach is our, our county's Healthy Start program. And through the Healthy Start program, it's we have been putting child welfare social workers in schools in, in a couple of different districts uh, in our county. And these social workers are in the schools in a very much in a prevention capacity. They're not in there doing the traditional work that, that our staff do, but they're working with families that, that may have struggles or having risk factors or having a variety of different uh, things going on where where they're they've had struggles and and where they might benefit from supports ideally to prevent them from ultimately coming into the child welfare system so it's some some activities we've been doing for a long time and some great partnerships we've had with with both the Winibi district more recently and a longer term partnership with the Oxnard um, elementary school district uh, with those social workers We've, I think I'm blank. I think we have about eight or nine of those workers in our various schools. And 
primarily in middle schools, as well as some elementary. And, and as you see, they provide those, those are at-risk services. What that model has been has been our has been the child welfare social workers so the social workers that work in 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 the department that, that i'm in the challenge is as we've wanted to replicate the good things that have come out of this model is we just don't have the child welfare staff to keep placing in those schools and yet there's been some really wonderful benefits of the model of the understanding of those staff that are working with families that might have risk factors that that could potentially lead to child welfare involvement and so we've been in, we're actually implementing now with the Winemi district, a model where it's not placing our staff in those schools, but we have social workers and other staff that are going to be hired by that district or are being hired. I think they're actually hired at this point. And we're wanting to make sure that their onboarding includes onboarding that's that's very similar uh, or inclusive of what our new, so the new social workers coming into child welfare are receiving. So they're going to be, we're going to be partnering with the district and inviting their staff to participate in the onboarding and the training of the new CFS as Children and Family Services. That's the child, our child welfare department in our new social worker training, setting up some infrastructure and liaison relationships with the other healthy start workers that are staff of the child welfare department, as well as a direct relationship to the to the uh, child abuse hotline. All of this, as I'll talk about in a minute, will tie directly to our community pathway, but we're also a county that is very much looking at wanting to explore and reform the way that we look at our mandated reporting system, which, as I know many folks have known, I think there's been several Caltrum webinars, I believe, on this. The, the mandated reporting system often leads to families being reported to child abuse hotlines that have stressors, that have, have things going on where they could benefit from supports, but they aren't things that really should be they aren't there aren't risk factors that should lead them into the child welfare system and but they would benefit from different reports and so there's a lot of energy at the state level to reform the mandated reporting system and we as a county are wanting to make that shift from mandated reporting where it really is necessary for those families that truly have those risk and safety concerns around abuse and neglect but also to look at a model to support families in their communities that may have other things going on, maybe related to basic needs or, or emerging stressors or, or factors that we can address before that call to the hotline needs to be made. And so that link to the hotline of, of those staff and the wellness centers, we think will be a nice bridge as we build that over the next, next year or two. And so definitely seeing this as, as part of that as well. Next slide, please. So you can see you was alluded to in the in the slide title. Another big aspect, a very specific aspect of what we see this this pilot, these two pilot schools as doing as being our pilot for our county's community pathway implementation for those. I'm guessing many folks are, but for those not familiar with the term community pathway, this ties to the work in in child welfare prevention, uh, tied to the Family First Prevention Services Act. And essentially, it it is the idea, as you see here, that families are already accessing different places in their communities, prevention hubs, as you see in that circle. Those could be wellness centers. Those could be family resource centers. Those might be primary care providers. They're places where families are already going to get help. Some of those families have a variety of needs, some of which may be risk factors for ultimate child welfare involvement. And the idea with the community pathway is instead of that prevention hub, in this case, instead of that wellness center in the Winnie School District, having to call the hotline to refer that family there, that that wellness hub is able, that prevention hub is able to provide supports and provide that linkage to, to the additional supports that that family might need uh, to address whatever their, their different needs might be. One of the things that's been really critical here, and, and one of the reasons we're looking at schools as, as these hubs, as well as, as other sites, which we'll talk about, is we want to go we want to be able to support families where they're comfortable being supported where the stigma is reduced and and we were very much informed and are being informed in this work by a group of of parents and who have lived expertise lived experience in touching a variety of different public systems you know child welfare system the special education system the public mental health system juvenile justice system as parents and they have worked 
under the leadership of our Child Abuse Prevention Council in, to help to inform our process going forward. They recently, actually at the same meeting that we had this, this review of the wellness centers, they provided a report to our, our interagency leadership team on some of their findings with the idea being that we want to make sure that the experience and the way in which we're setting up the structure is one that works for those families we're reaching. And, and I'd say part of that and, and acknowledging it as someone that's worked in child welfare for, for, for a chunk of my career, a big part of that was acknowledging the, the, the trauma that the system has historically you know, generated and caused in, in their communities and those families. And so it, I, I think for those that are doing this work, take the time to, to hear those people that, you're, that, are, that have that lived expertise and to acknowledge the role that, that systems have played, even, even as, you know, as we're trying to change things for the better. You know, we, I think that acknowledgement of the, you know, the impact of systems and, and systems like the child welfare system have had. Our county has, you saw a disproportionate number of, of Latino families that have come in within in a certain, in some small communities within three zip codes within our county, or actually five zip codes are half of the entries into our system. We know that community is, is disproportionately impacted. And so that, that work has been critical. And that guidance has been so valuable. And so we we are going to be working with that parent leadership team as, as well as a youth leadership team that's also being developed to continue to guide this, this work going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So a few things that we're hoping to achieve in this pilot. One is to look at where we can coordinate, where we can streamline those services and supports to families. These are these are elements of, of AB 2083, where we want to help create a more seamless experience so families aren't, aren't having to tell their story over and over, where they aren't having to try to figure out how to navigate four different systems. So using it to test some of that critical for us, and this I think gets to that sustainability question that Dr. Morales is talking about, we very much want to explore where we can leverage other funding streams. And if any of you a plug for other webinars that we that have been out there on, on integrated funding, there's some really exciting opportunities that are out there and in, in tying to CalAIM and some of the service categories around, around peer workers or, or community supports of both service categories and provider types that we really hope to be able to to pilot and try on and and figure out how to develop in a way that can then be replicated uh, more broadly across our county um, to help ensure sustainable funding. In the short term, what we're there's some funding that's helping to support them through SB HIP, but we're also using our our uh, prevention block grant, which is which are dollars from the state uh, to help get prevention activities. Up off the ground, but we really know that we need to we need sustainability. And one, so we're going to be working very closely with our partners. But also, this is where we're going to be leveraging our our interagency leadership team. We have a fiscal, a financial uh, subcommittee of the ILT that will we will be asking at some point to help understand more thoroughly where those braiding and blending and and integration of financial opportunities uh, will be. This will also be a way through the wellness centers because of the community pathway to access Title IV-E, which are the child welfare federal funding uh, streams for those families that reach the level of a potential risk for child welfare involvement, um, but ideally to, to help keep them out of that system. Uh, also linkage to primary and secondary supports, as you probably know. Family First Prevention Services Act and those five, five, four e leveraging opportunities are really more for families with higher levels of, of risk of child welfare involvement. Uh, the, we're also wanting to make sure we're accessing other kinds of supports, basic needs and other supports before families get to that high level of risk. One of which is in our prevention plan, we have built in a guaranteed income pilot. So the idea that, in, that families will receive a set amount of money, certain families with it's, it, with certain eligibility, a set amount of money each month for a period of time with the goal of allowing those families to then make, this, make the decision of what's best for them to address their needs. Um, uh, and, and it's 
many people probably know there's been a great body of emerging research on the benefit of universal basic income and and guaranteed income uh, to support families. And it, I think it really gets to that self-determination idea that families often know what they need and often what they need isn't services. It's it's making sure they have they have a roof over their heads, making sure they have that little bit of extra cushion to to support their family differently or or to look for that better job or or you know whatever it might be to best meet their needs. And so we we will be looking at, at this as a place to to pilot that as well. We are we're lucky because we're one of the pilot counties already for the state guaranteed income work that's happening. We're one of the seven count seven not counties but seven uh, programs that's launched, and so we'll be leveraging the work of that pilot, which specifically is focusing on on young adults who are transitioning out of the child welfare system, and which has been going for about a month now. And we're already seeing some some great results. Next slide, please. One more big piece to this this opportunity with this district, <laughs> we're keeping them busy. We are also a county that is in the early stages of a, of a very robust process to develop what's called a community information exchange and so an infrastructure to better share information across systems. And that's both a there's both a process part of that as well as a technical part of that. And so this is the that the CIE, the Ventura County. Uh, community Information Exchange Leadership Group has made the decision that the SB Hip Wellness Centers will be one of the areas in which that work will be piloted, and so we're and you can see some some details on there. So the idea is that we're again trying to break down those barriers that often make it challenging for families uh, to access supports that they that they need, and so that work will be happening really in parallel and in integration in an integrated way with the work on the community pathway that was in that previous slide. So really, really excited about the opportunities with this and then the opportunities to take this and replicate it uh, going forward. Next slide. So this is sort of a high level summary of a whole bunch of things I just talked about, but you can get a sense of of some of the aspects that, that we're talking about. So there'll, you know, there's governance aspects here around some con contracting that we're establishing with the district and uh, in multiple places with memorandum of understanding with the financing pieces that I that I referenced here um, to move this forward. Data will be critical and you can see there our overall data as a county shows that the, the highest proportion of uh, families that enter the, our child welfare system are those families with young children, but we also are seeing a, an uptick in those that are kind of middle, early high school age, which is where the middle school aspect of this will be so critical. Um, and then that parent and community engagement I talked about and how this, this very much aligns with that, that parent voice work we're doing. Next slide. The next two models, I'll, I'll do a more brief overview, but just want to give that broader context of, of these, these various models. The third model is, is what's called the Neighborhoods for Learning and Wellness, NFLs. And what the NFLs are, these are essentially, these are not essentially, these are family resource centers. They are operated by our, our first five Ventura County partners and have been in our community for a long time. They very much embody and embrace the the true FRC tenants, which I'll, I'll show in a minute, but in a parallel way to what I described, those different elements of what I described for the uh, Winimi pilot, minus at this point, the community information exchange, we are also in conversations with them about piloting uh, the community pathway and doing a very similar pilot and looking at some similar strategies of integration, of leveraging finances of, of service experience in initially starting with probably one or two of the NFLs in similar communities um, as as the uh, Winnie Me pilot. And that really is getting to, to what Dr. Brown was talked about earlier, how our plan, uh, our community prevention, our comprehensive prevention plan very intentionally is is focusing on families with young children. Next slide. And here you can see elements of those national family FRCs, family resource center, of course, um, of family centeredness, of family strengthening, of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, strengthening of community and, and evaluation. Um, we're part of that will be looking at where, ways in which not just we can integrate, but in some cases, co-locate uh, services. I know there's some conversations happening around there. And so really excited to be working with our, our early childhood partners in that work, um, wanting to very much leverage leverage the good work that they're already doing in, in the community. Next slide. 
And then the last one, and this is one that is, is in the very early stages, but the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, see, I got that acronym, another one of the uh, behavioral health funding streams, new funding opportunities through the state. We as a county, and this is, this is the Behavioral Health Department leading this work um, to develop a this, I'm sorry, rewind, the BCHIP or the Behavioral Health uh, con uh, Continuum Infrastructure Program is essentially a bricks and mortar funding stream. And our county was, was fortunate to receive some funding uh, to develop a wellness center. This is not a school-based wellness center. It's a community-based wellness center. This would, this would also be a wellness center that is going to be in the Oxnard area of our county, but one of those areas that, that has, again, shows some of the highest uh, levels of, of needs. And the idea of this wellness center, first of all, to start with, it was behavioral health that led the planning, but it was very much a united planning effort by many of the partners in our in our system work, uh, Office of Education, because this wellness center, though not a school-based one, very much builds on and embodies many of the same tenants, many of the same elements of the school-based work that, that our education partners are leading. And so they were critical. And one of Dr. Morales said, I think was had to call in on vacation from, from I think Europe because there was some tight timelines at one point, but just showed the level of the partnership. Um, First Five was a critical partner and, and an integral partner in this work. And they were actually, they are written in and were written into the funding as partners that will have shared space on this site um, and will be doing their work in that in that site. Uh, juvenile probation as well, because there's the idea being that this is a center that will support families, but will also support youth that may be coming in on their own uh, to, to receive support. So there'll be various types of programming to support them, um, more social programming, mental health service, other services. And then, of course, uh, the Human Services Agency and, and uh, department I'm in, the Children and Family Services Department, where we were part of this as well. This is another site where we we ultimately see uh, a community pathway opportunity because it's a place where families might be coming in to, for other kinds of needs and supports, but will also be an opportunity to, to help prevent those with those risk factors and those, those potential worries that might lead them into trouble for involvement to, to gain the supports that, that they might need. And so this one is, this is one where the funding has been secured. I believe the site just went to the board of supervisors. And so now they got, now there's the process of getting the site ready to roll out, but it'll be an exciting opportunity for us to put all of this into action over the next couple of years and, and under the, the leadership on this case of, of our behavioral health partners. That was a lot. I want to pause here before uh, kicking over to Dr. Morales. If there's any questions or, or actually, and if not, we can, Dr. Morales, I can kick it off to you to, to take us home and, and wrap us up. You're on mute. As you can uh, uh, hear, there's a lot of enthusiasm from all of us, but I, I want to say again, we're only three people that are part of this movement, and there's many more uh, that are not uh, on this webinar screen. Um, and I see that many of them are on as, as participants, which is great. Um, I think it's an understatement that everyone in a variety of agencies, even nonprofit organizations in our county, they want to be involved in this work. Um, something that is um, very important is the infrastructure of communication that we've established. What we've been able to do is for every time that, that something comes up, and we've always said, wouldn't it be great? If only this uh, agency were to do this, it would be a lot more efficient for us. Well, some of those simple questions that come up on a daily basis, we now have an infrastructure to deal with them because now that question that might come up doesn't just sit on the shelf or isn't just evaporate in us. We now have a mechanism to take that question, no matter how small, or how big it is and chew it over at the very levels of our, our infrastructure. And I think that in and of itself is what gets us better every day. Uh, and I say every day because when we all read our emails, it almost seems sometimes that the state is rolling out a new program or a, or a new grant structure or, or a new this, a new that, that. Something not on here is also 
how the education community is embracing right now school-based Medi-Cal services uh, right now. And that's also part of our sustainability effort, but we're also closely working with all the agency partners because we have this infrastructure, as well as have deep relationship with Gold Coast, who's also a good partner in, um, in that uh, venue. Um, I just wanna thank, uh, thank all of you for being interested uh, to be part of this webinar and give us an opportunity to share a story that is evolving, but we're very proud of. Um, and I also wanna thank all of you in your local communities for doing all the above and beyond efforts that you're doing uh, to meet the needs of your community members. And if we've helped um, highlight or inspire um, any movement towards a deeper coherence amongst all the agencies that you work with, we're very happy for that. And we're also happy to collaborate and share um, offline if necessary, because I think we all share the deep commitment of serving and meeting the needs uh, of the community members uh, that most need our help navigating the complex systems um, that is that exists in each one of our local communities. I know we're we're at a, a fifteen minute uh, uh, mark here. I, I don't know if there's any questions that or comments that you want us to to react to um, in the chat. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll I'll turn it back over to to our hosts. All right. And I'm just taking a quick look now at the taking a quick look at our Q&A feature to make sure there aren't any questions that we've missed. We're taking one last look. Of course, for you attendees on the call, if you have any questions about what has been covered today, please start dropping that. You can probably drop it into the chat right about now and we'll catch that. I'll give you one moment to review uh, your notes, see what questions you have. And then if there are none, I will make sure to tell you what to expect next. So I will pause here and give you just a moment. All right, uh, if sorry, you have no... Oh, I, just want to, uh, I just shout out to Chris Ridge. Thank you for helping me with my uh, acronym, Chris. Chris is our, one of our partners from, from the Office of Education. So thank you for that. Wonderful. All right, I'm taking one last look. Now, if you have no questions, but you would like to say thank you, feel free to, oh, wait, 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 take it back. I think I see something in the Q&A. Um, where will Model 4 Center be located is one question in the chat. Oh, Jack, I don't know the I don't know the specific answer, although I know there's a couple of behavioral health folks on here from our uh, our county that might I know it will be in Oxnard. Um, and I don't know if any of them that are on have the answer to that. If you do feel free to drop it into the chat, but it will be in it will be in Oxnard, <laughs> which I know isn't very specific for for those folks in Ventura County. Jack, by the way, is another critical partner with our resource and referral uh, entity in the county. And, and just a shout out because that early childhood piece is so, so critical. Wonderful. Uh, there is one last question. It looks like it's in the chat. Are you incorporating the CHW model with Cal AIM? We are definitely going to be looking at that. I assume CHW in this case, community health worker. It's one of the things we absolutely are going to be exploring um, and hoping hoping to do. I know there's been a lot of talk about that across the state um, as something that could be helpful for community pathway sustainability as as counties roll that out. So it is one of the aspects we'll be we'll be looking at. And it looks as though we are up to date on the questions in the Q&A and in the chat. So if you don't have a question, but you'd like to show your thanks, the best way to do that will be to share an emoji so you can share a reaction with your, with your facilitators today because we are gonna be dropping some information in the chat you don't wanna lose. In the chat, we are going to drop a copy of the survey link at the completion of your survey, which takes about two minutes. It is, uh, you are given access to your certificate of attendance. A copy of this recording and related resources will be sent to your registration email in about two days. And with that, oh, I see someone here says, uh, VCBH is looking for a site on Pleasant Valley Road. So if oh. you're in Ventura County, you know where that is. 
Awesome. All right, everyone. Thank you all so much to, on behalf of Caltrain and I'm sure also all of these attendees, we just want to say thank you all three of you so much for your time and your experience and for sharing um, such great strategy. So we hope you have a wonderful week, everyone. We'll see you again.